I'm so glad you're joining us today. My name is Amy Kathleen Lee. I'm with Dancing with Ed, and I'm excited for this morning. I'm excited to have this conversation with a special guest, uh, Amy Moranti. I met Amy last summer. She um, started volunteering for Dancing with Ed, doing social media and various projects. And as I got to know her, um, I learned that she also works in mental health as a volunteer for the crisis text line. And right now with everything that's going on, I thought it would be a really good idea to, to talk more about that resource um, and what it's all about, ask her some questions, pick her brain a little bit so she can share her knowledge with you. So let's just get right into this. Amy, um, you know, tell them more about you, anything that you think uh, you would wanna share with our audience. Tell us about you. So as you said, I'm Amy. I graduated from SUNY Geneseo with a degree in political science and I minored in Spanish. Um, when I'm not volunteering for Dancing with Ed or Crisis Text Line, I'm volunteering for another small nonprofit called Help for Parents Network. And um, I, since February, have been volunteering for the Crisis Text Line. Um, in my free time, I like to listen to podcasts, watch reality TV, or listen to music. Um, since volunteering, I've become more interested in mental health and promoting how important taking care of your mental health is, because at the end of the day, your mental health is your physical health. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you have um, a big heart for helping people, Thank and you. I've noticed that about you, and that's one of the things that we definitely um, bond and click with is that wanting to serve and give back to others. And so for people who don't know what the crisis text line is, what give us a breakdown. What is the crisis text line? So the crisis text line launched in August of 2013 as the first and only national 24 seven crisis intervention hotline that's done entirely by text. Um, so the purpose of the text line is to help individuals that are going from a hot moment and the crisis counselors work with them to take them to a cool calm. Um, crisis counselors are there to work with the texters and guide them to find relief. We're not here to tell them, we're not here to give them advice, we're there to work with them and collaborate on how they can find relief and be safe. Wow. I, um, I know that um, I myself have utilized a similar resource and what what I liked about um, having the access to someone who um, you know doesn't really know me or my situation. Uh, I remember feeling when I was I called a hotline. I remember feeling like his voice was sort of that thing that was keeping me connected. That that voice connecting me to the real world. And it is such a valuable thing that you're doing, um, keeping you know helping people go from that hot place, that crisis. Uh, into someplace calm. And so um, I'm curious though, like what, what motivated you to, to become a volunteer with this type of resource? Okay. I know you want to help people, but anything else? Mm -hmm. Well, I was uh, working part-time looking for a full-time job and it just so happened that I signed up for the crisis text line oh, just here because I was looking for a full-time job and I wanted to find something else to do that I could interact with people mm -hmm. um, and kind of make a difference, you know, in real real time. Um, so I signed up in February and happened to have my first shift before the pandemic hit. So it was perfect timing that I signed up, you know, right before one of the biggest changes of this year and, you know, this decade really. Yeah. This like half, half the century. Yeah. Were you, were you nervous? You're like, okay, so I just, I just signed up. I'm a newbie volunteer and boom, we're in a pandemic. Were, were you kind of nervous? I wasn't nervous because I feel like the training really prepared me for anything and you have a supervisor there and you have, you know, other people you can speak with that really support you and make you feel like you're not in it alone. Um, and it also kind of made me feel good to know that there are other people going through such similar struggles during this time. A lot of people are feeling lonely. A lot of people, you know, are scared because this is a really scary time. So it felt really nice to know that I was able to, you know, help people get through such a unique and crazy time in our history. And so you mentioned your training. What was that like? 
So training um, was two weeks and you do a bunch of different assignments and you do a lot of um, practice runs and they really make sure that you are set. When you sign up for your first shift, you feel 100% confident. That I, I can relate to um, kind of preparing yourself for uh, this experience where you might be put in a situation where like, well, what, you know, what do I do? When I was certified as a QPR trainer, question, persuade, refer, three-step action plan to save someone's life when they're in a mental health crisis. And I remember um, going through the training and becoming a gatekeeper and we had a role play where you had to practice using QPR to save someone's life. And I remember being so nervous um, just in the role play, mm -hmm. just in asking someone, hey, are you thinking of suicide? Yeah. And saying that is scary. Yeah. So asking someone such a personal question, sorry, my lighting's kind of spasming. Mm -hmm. Asking such a personal question uh, for me was like, what if they say yes? Then what do I do? You know, yeah. but, uh, having that support around you must make a real difference. A hundred percent. And it's definitely um, different because you think, you know, there's this myth that if you ask someone about suicide, they're more likely to, you know, want to take action, but it's just, people need to have that conversation. And when you ask someone straight up, are you having thoughts of suicide? And they can give you an open, honest answer. Then you can figure out how you're going to work with them in that conversation. So if they say, no, you know, I'm not having those thoughts. And we say, okay, let's figure out how we can get you some relief tonight. And we can work with them to find some coping skills, you know, someone to confide in, in their life. Whereas if they say yes, then you go, okay, you know, what's, what are you planning on doing? Um, do you have access? Um, mm -hmm. When are you planning on doing this? Then you can work right. with them to see, okay, do we need to, you know, we safety plan with them. Do we need to call in an emergency medical service on their behalf? Or can we work with them to kind of get them to find some relief tonight and to maybe, you know, say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Right. And why is it so important to rule out if they're thinking of suicide? Because you want to make sure you're giving them the most accurate support that they need. Um, if they're calling for, you know, anxiety, if they're calling for depression, if they're calling for issues with an eating disorder, you want to make sure you're giving them as specific help as you can, because yeah. it's not just a general blanket. You want to really dig in on what this person needs and give them the support, you know, the tools that they need for their specific situation. Yeah. When I'm teaching suicide prevention, I tell people it's kind of like when you go to someone who's, you know, maybe who had a heart attack, the first thing you do is check for a pulse mm. and for breathing. And you don't do CPR if they have a pulse. Yeah. You know, so you don't really need to do the suicide conversation with somebody who isn't suicidal. Yep. So you, you have to rule that out first. And that's why it's so important to establish, is this a safety issue? Is this gonna be about suicide or is this, well, of course not like the other issues aren't as scary. Yeah. Um, but when I was learning more about this resource and your role, um, I came across the term empathy superstar. So you are empathy superstars? Mm -hmm. So basically to be able to succeed and be a successful crisis counselor, it's important to be an empathy superstar. And that means that you're able for the duration of the conversation to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand why they're feeling a certain way. And with that, you work with them to collaborate on a plan to help them find calm. So it's not about giving advice. It's not about telling them what to do. It's not about what you would do in that situation. Right about find, helping them find the answers within them. And in that, however long the conversation is, you put yourself in their shoes to really see what they need and see what they need within themselves to get through this. So it sounds like, well, two things. It sounds like you're, you're really putting um, what that person needs, you know, first in a sense that, you know, um, you giving advice is kind of like you putting it on them instead of them taking the lead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, empathy is, 
feeling with people. I love Brene Brown's, Brene Brown's work and she talks about empathy. And I think, but with empathy though, that, that's a vulnerable thing to do. Yeah. That's a really vulnerable thing to do because for my, when my experiences with trying to be empathetic, I try to say, okay, it must be really hard to be in the situation they're in. Mm -hmm. Man, like, and almost imagine that so that I can sort of like meet them where they are at and mm -hmm. validate empathy validates yeah man this is you know having these thoughts or having that happen to you today that's really really hard and how do you think validating them validation helps how do you think validation you think, uh, validating helps because everyone wants to be heard no matter what situation they're going through and if you feel as though you know, you talk to another person about it and they say, it's understandable that you're feeling this way or it's reasonable for you to feel this way. They're going to think, you know what? They're right. And mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. that, you know, second level of support and they right. can say, I can get through this because I'm not, you know, I'm not crazy for thinking this. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not, I'm trying to look for the word. Um, they know that they are heard and understood and feeling understood is so important because we're humans. We want connection. We want to feel, you know, understood and heard with, with each other. So mm -hmm. to feel mm -hmm. that their situation is validated and their feelings are validated and their response is validated, that's going to help them work through whatever situation mm -hmm. they're going through. Absolutely. I love this information. Um, and I, I can relate to, you know, feeling heard when I'm in the classroom and I'm talking to seventh graders, eighth graders, high schoolers, you know, it, it demonstrates the idea that when you're listening to someone, you are creating space for them to feel heard. And when people feel heard, that's when they start to heal. Yep. That's the first, that's where it starts. And us as humans, you know, we have those basic needs. Um, to belong, to have meaning and to have purpose and to know that, you know, your experience is valid. Your pain is valid. Like it's not, if I think it's a big deal because it's not about me, mm -hmm. it's about them. So if they think, yes, this hurts me, then it hurts them. Yep. Right. And that is, that is really opening up that space for them to, and again, them to explore. Yep their own feelings and you navigating with them. Um, real quick, I, I'm curious, you've, you have seen, you mentioned the pandemic, you have seen an increase yes. in texters mm -hmm. um, reaching out to you. And I'm curious, like, what are some of the issues? What are some of the struggles that are common that you're, you're hearing about? So definitely a lot of COVID anxiety, whether people, I've seen a lot of people text in that have lost a family member mm. and that is, you know, it's very, very difficult to deal with losing someone during this time because there's a lot of isolation and people are, you know, supposed to be quarantining, et cetera. So it's hard to lose mm. someone and not have, you know, the proper, uh, going through the proper stages of mourning. Um, I see a lot of that. I see a lot of people just suffering through depression and anxiety related to the pandemic. A lot of people that are lonely that are saying, you know, I haven't seen someone in X amount of time. Even, you know, I do phone calls, but that's still not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of um, people having issues with school and dealing with their everyday lives that have been affected by the pandemic. Um, a lot of students that are like, this is so overwhelming. I yeah. can't deal with this. So we work with them and we find out, you know, what can you do to make this bearable? What can you do to change the quality of your life during a very hard time? So, and you, so it's an array of, of issues from anxiety, eating disorders. Um, is there anything in particular that you would be like the most thing that's coming up the most or is I think it can I think a lot of it is I would say the top are depression mm -hmm. which ties in with loneliness mm -hmm. anxiety 
Um, and I would say those are the top two that I see. Um, the rest can vary a lot of people in relationships that are having relationship trouble reach out. Okay. Um, if they're in an abusive relationship, whether it's physical or emotional, if they're having a bad relationship with their family or with mm -hmm. their friends, a lot of people reach out in those situations. Um, and it's people of all ages. You know, it can be texters under 18 or texters over 18. Uh, mm -hmm. People that have been married with kids have texted in and say, you know, I'm really struggling right now. Um, yeah. Teenagers say, mm -hmm. I'm really struggling right now. It's really, that's what I really like about it is it's a broad group of people all coming mm -hmm. with all different issues. And what's really nice is for the duration of that conversation, I just focus in on that one person situation and what that person needs and just provide them a safe space to open up and share judgment free um, between just them and I and really make them feel like they can, can share whatever they want or share or not share whatever they want. Um, they have that opportunity right. to tell me as much or as little as they right. choose. And so I want to know a little bit more about the process, like how it works. So if somebody wants to use the resource, let's bring them through that. So what's the first thing they do? So the first thing is they would text 741741. That's easy um, to remember. Also, 741, yeah. 741. Mm -hmm. There's also on the website, you can get connected through. They show on Facebook, you can get connected through. There's like a couple of different ways, but 741741 is, you know, just okay. pick up your phone. And then in under a few minutes, they'll be connected to a trained crisis counselor. And, you know, then the conversation starts and it goes from there. So if somebody reaches out and maybe they're worried that if it's confidential, is it, is it confidential or? Yes. So the line is confidential. Um, only the crisis counselor in a conversation knows what's being said. A texter, as I said before, can share as little or much as they want. And we take confidentially confidentiality very seriously. The only time information might be shared is if, um, emergency services is absolutely necessary, which is when a texter is in danger to themselves or to others. And is there, have you ever had a, a young, younger person, like yes. even like under the age of 12? Is that, so, is that common? That can happen. And in those mm -hmm. situations, they can choose to report it. So they kind of hold the power. So we want to, we have to report it if they're under a certain age, but they give the choice of whether they share their name, they share their location. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, when I'm talking in the classroom about resources and the, the teens often ask, mm -hmm. you know, um, and my parents, are my parents going to find out because they're reporting abuse? Yeah. They're reporting domestic violence. Um, and it's a it's a legitimate worry yeah you know because again they're they're um we're asking them to we're giving them permission to open up and and maybe they've done that in the past and they were hurt or deceived yeah. or lied to so it can be it's really scary just uh, just that moment of of hitting 741741 and then the person answers and then asks you well how does that Break that down. So what is your, you mentioned your role in the conversation earlier. So what kind of um, questions do you ask them? So the first thing I do is I introduce myself and say, mm -hmm. hi, I'm Amy. I'm here to support you and give mm -hmm. you the support you need, you deserve. Um, and then I say, you know, tell me more about what made you reach out tonight. So I like, so they give me a little bit more. And then the first thing I do is I say, you know, it took, depending on the situation, you know, it took real strength to reach out tonight. Um, mm -hmm. Are you, I want to check in on your safety. Are you having thoughts of suicide? So I go through that. And if they say yes, then I go up and say, as I mentioned before, um, how are you doing it? Do you have the means? And what is your time frame? So if they answer yes to all those questions, then that's when it becomes a, um, a different situation but if they answer no then I say okay so then we know they're not having suicidal thoughts let's see what we can do to work with this texter to get them to find relief tonight so the first question I ask is how long have you been dealing with insert emotion um, they will give me a 
whatever time. And if it's something that's been for so long, I like to remind them that they have great resilience for fighting through for so long. Cause a lot of people don't realize that it is resilience, that it's a really yeah. admirable trait and they think less of themselves because they're struggling. But if they've been struggling for a long time and they're choosing to live and they're choosing to fight for their life, that is an incredibly admirable trait to have because not a lot of people have that drive. Um, then I asked them if they've shared this pain with anyone else in their life, um, a friend, a family member, a therapist. And I see, has that helped them? Has that provided you relief? Has that made you feel good? And sometimes, yes. Sometimes people say, I have literally no one else to turn to. Mm -hmm. So that's when we say, okay, let's explore this further. And one question I like to ask is, you know, I go back to their strength for reaching out and I say, what are some things that make you feel strong or make you feel powerful or make you feel your best? And it can be anything. It can be cooking. It can be going for a run. It could be watching their favorite TV show, listening to their favorite album. You know, there's so many different things that may seem small, but can really change our, how we're feeling. So uh, sometimes if it's watch, if watch their favorite show, I say, tell me more about your favorite show. How does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. um, I had someone text in and say they love to watch the movie Moana. I also love that movie. Love Amazing film. <laughs> uh, I feel so empowered. Oh my God, yeah. After I watch that, I just want to like run onto the beach. Exactly. Such a great movie. So I was yeah. like, movies are a great <laughs> source of relief. So I said, yeah. maybe the next time you feel triggered, how would you feel if you put Moana on and distraction free sat through and just was present for the whole movie? And they said, you know, I think I'd feel a lot better. Um, something else is how about going for a walk or going for a run? And they would say, you know, I don't know if I have the duration to do that for so long. And I say, you start out small, 10 minutes, then you work your way up because every, everything counts. 10 minutes is not a small, a small feat. If you're not be able to get out of bed, going for a 10 minute walk is a really big deal. And you should be able to celebrate those small victories and work your way up. Um, I spoke with someone and I said, they said they liked reading. And I said, why don't you, you know, grab your favorite book, get comfortable and cozy and read. And they said, you know, I don't know if I have the attention span for that. And that's understandable. So I said, you know, set a timer and start out small, five to 10 minutes. And then the next day you work your way up and then finally you're reading for an hour. And that's giving you a daily sense of relief, a daily time where you're just focusing on yourself and you're focusing on taking care of you because that is so important. I like how <clears throat> you focus on what's gonna work for you. Um, not a list of things that, you know, people might, might want to do. Uh, it makes it real personal, excuse me. <clears throat> it makes it very personal. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like some of the things that you are sharing are um, that we practice for distress tolerance, learning to, to sit and be with the stress and the, you know, whatever the emotion is, but utilizing, bringing in a skill with you in that space. Mm -hmm. So if it's, I'm feeling my anxiety and it's intense, I'm going to validate that. Yes, I'm feeling anxiety. Like, and I think what's really helped me is that identifying, yes, right now I'm feeling and it's anxiety or it's loneliness and naming it. And then, okay, and now I'm going to bring in, with the anxiety, the skill, and I'm going to sit, watch the movie. I'm going to sit and um, wrap, you know, the, the fluffiest, softest blanket I can find around my body and do some sensory stuff, yeah. you know, or, or have, um, you can go to the dollar store and buy, like, all these fidget toys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, even... The, even the ones that have like the fart putty. Yep. Mm -hmm. you know, where you stick your fingers in like, and it's, I'm sorry, it sounds ridiculous, mm -hmm. but it breaks like up <laughs> the stress and it yeah. makes you laugh. It, it's just 
anything that you want to bring in that space. And, and I, I love how um, you encourage them to find something that works for them because you're right. You know, coping is not, it's going to look different for everyone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I have yeah. a referral that I like to share with people. Um, it's 99 coping skills. And I like to share it after we've gone through a specific one for them that in case, you know, later in the week and they think, you know what, this is not working for me. They can get inspired by a list of 99 coping mm -hmm. skills. And it's kind of an interactive sheet. You can check the boxes. It's, you know, go for a walk, make a pillow fort. Like there's all different things that are very different. And yeah. if you're feeling like, you know, this, this one thing isn't working for me, then you have a list of 99 things. And at least one of those is bound to inspire you. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, and something that you can come back to mm -hmm. <clears throat> because as we grow, as we move through our situations and our experiences, our needs might change. And knowing that there's other things to try, um, I, you know, what, having bipolar disorder, I know my brain well enough now that I know it tends to be like black and white, like this didn't work. So this doesn't work at all. Just because it didn't work today or like, oh, I just don't feel like it's working for me. And I just, and then I, and dump it to the side instead of, instead of just what well, it, you know, it wasn't what I expected or it wasn't what I necessarily needed, but I can always try it again. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, giving that, that flexibility to try different things and, and validating that there's nothing wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Like there is nothing wrong with struggling right now. It's yeah. totally normal. And that's what I remind a lot of people is, you are not alone in this, especially right now in the current, you know, world that we're living in. Everything is so uncertain. Everything is changing every second. I remind people, you are not alone. So many other people are going through the same struggles. And, you know, the way our society is, we like to hide that and we like to keep it to ourselves. There's a lot of stigma. People are not very open about how they're struggling, but we are all, we're all humans and we're all going through, you know, the same uncertain and distressing times right now you know yes. people react differently um it affects people more than it affects others um so i like to remind people you know you are most certainly not alone right now and yeah, even we, if you feel alone there are others out there that are going through the same exact thing and collectively experiencing the the intense stress and you had mentioned to me that not all conversations are equal. Yes. Uh, so, so what do you, that, what do you mean? So that is very, very true. You're going to have some conversations where someone messages in and they work with you very easily. They say, this is what I'm struggling with tonight. That's a good idea. I'm going to go and do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a good night. And you're like, okay, not bad. You have other conversations where, people are not very open and you kind of have to pry a bit just because you want to make sure you're giving them what they need and what they deserve. You want to make sure, you know, you give them the support, the empathy, the care that they deserve as a human being. And they might not be interested in sharing too much with you. Sometimes, you know, the responses can be one word where other people can, I've gotten like six messages, huge paragraphs of people telling me start to end their situation. And other people that are very, very hesitant to give a lot. And one thing um, about the text line is when a texture feels they, you know, they don't talk about it anymore, or, you know, if someone comes into the room with them, whatever, they can just send stop and it ends the conversation immediately. So sometimes I've been in situations where conversations are going really well and they send in stop and it ends. Oh, wow. And I have to remember, you know, not one can't take it personally. And I have to not think about what is happening because then I have to move on to another conversation. So it can be very, very difficult sometimes. And a lot, some, you know, conversations are very intense subject matter. Some are a lot, um, you know, I'm having trouble in school, I'm having trouble in this, but others, you know, people are being abused, people are, you know, 
actively having thoughts of suicide. So there's a huge difference in conversations and they, you know, not, not all conversations are equal. Not all are going to have the outcome that you want them to have. And you have to, when you, when I go onto every shift, I remind myself that. It's not, it's not going to be easy every time. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be someone who's going to want to be open and work with you every single time. And I have to remind myself, you know, it's their journey. It's their struggle. And they get to respond how they want to because it's their life. Yeah. Do you ever feel scared? Um, sometimes I definitely. Like when they hit, when they say stop and you're, or, and you've really kind of like gained some ground and. Yeah you know how vulnerable they are and then you see stop how does that make how does that make you feel it it definitely it's tough because i i take it personally and you're not supposed to take it personally but i think did i do something wrong did i say something wrong and even if i said all the right things i'm still going to think about it and i'm going to you know a few hours later be like man i really wish i knew what happened and it weighs on you but you have to remember again to take care of yourself in this situation and to, as a crisis counselor, say, okay, you know, they are on their own journey. They're going through their own struggle. Maybe this wasn't right for them. Maybe mm -hmm. they're not at the time where they can have an open dialogue. Maybe someone walked in the room. You know, there's a lot of maybes and what ifs. So I just kind of remind myself it's nothing personal and that people need People can only be open to healing if it's on their time and if it's on the right time for them. So maybe it's not the right time for them right now and maybe in the future they'll be more open. So that's what I just try to tell myself. And that's, it. yeah, you're, you're human um, just like they are and you're an empathy superstar. So when you're, when you are an empathy superstar, you know, uh, an empathetic person, we, we tend to feel things intensely. Yeah. And I can, I can relate to when I was doing crisis work at a domestic violence shelter and I was working as a children's specialist and I was seeing the kids come in <clears throat> I was doing these, you know, assessments and figuring out, you know, asking them very personal questions that were, had some scary answers and I would do this all day long. And then, you know, I would be on call in the middle of the night and, um, you know, from the the hotline calling me saying, you know, I have a mom with five kids on the street corner in the rain and all the shelters are full. What do I do? And, mm -hmm. and so it, it's just, it's such a stressful job. And we, how do you cope with that? Like, how do you cope with the stress of your job on a long, you know, shift? Mm -hmm. So a lot of like, so we give texters coping skills. I, you know, go, have my own coping skills and I usually mm -hmm. do my shifts at night. And so I like to, when I'm done, I go take a hot shower just to kind of cool down because a lot of stuff can build. Like I always feel things build in my neck and my shoulders and in my jaw, like I get very tense. Mm -hmm. So I like to go just loosen up. And then I like to put on um, a fa one of my favorite sitcoms. I like to watch The Office. I'm watching Shit's Creek right now. I just put something on that doesn't, you don't need to think too much. And something that I know it's going to make me laugh and I know it's going to de-stress me. And, you know, that pattern, so I do it at night, I finish my shift. If it was really particularly stressful, I'll take an extra long shower and then I just sit down, put on my pajamas and watch something I know is going to give me joy and make me feel good. Because it's important to take care of yourself when you are feeling with people because, you know, like you said, the empathy superstar thing, we're feeling the pain they're feeling and we're trying to best be in that situation. So when you're taking on a lot of conversations, it's a lot. It's a lot of up and down. You're feeling a lot of different things. So I want to make sure that I'm able to decompress and de-stress so that the time, the next time I sign onto my shift, I am a blank slate and I'm ready to start mm -hmm. over and give, you know, every texter the support that they need and then the support that they deserve. And that takes a lot of emotional energy. And like you said, when we're feeling with people, we have to remind ourselves, um, you know, we're feeling maybe pain with someone, but it's not our pain. No. Mm -hmm. And it's a, and it's an emotional boundary that I think in the beginning of the work, um, when you first go into mental health, it, it's tough. Yeah. Um, there's burnouts are really, really common. Mm -hmm. And 
it's really important to learn those mental and emotional boundaries and say, you know, this is not this, you know, whose pain is whose here, you know? Um, and that's the, the, ba the balance that, you know, we have to find. And it takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, compassion fatigue is real. Yeah. Um, we just, we give, 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 give. So I like how you have this routine that you do that, um, you know, not only helps your physical body, because I, we know that our, our mental health and our physical health are connected. We know that um, when we're mo mental and emotionally overwhelmed, we, our immune system might go down and we're, we're more susceptible to being sick. Um, and then, you know, mental burnout affects all the other areas of our life. And so in the helping profession and in like a crisis counselor world, it is, it is almost as more important uh, taking care of you than the people you are serving because you have to put your oxygen mask on first. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I'm curious, you know, what have you learned about your own mental health mm -hmm. since becoming a crisis counselor? So I've learned that it's important to anticipate things and to, and, and to figure out what your trigger is and what makes you <clears throat> feel anxious, what's going to make you feel not your best and to address it right away. Because a lot of um, text conversations are people that, you know, are, they're not in a crisis, but if they don't take right. care of it, they will be in a crisis. And it's a lot of, there's a timeline, you know, you hit a certain point and it becomes a crisis, but if you can address the situation beforehand and anticipate and figure out what your triggers are and what's going to make you feel, you know, horrible, and you can address that, then you can heal and you can figure out how to live your daily life with these struggles Say, you know what, I know that's a trigger for me. So I'm going to go do some self care and go work through some of my coping skills because I can anticipate that's going to lead me to a crisis situation. And it's important to, you know, speak with other people. And even if you're speaking with a friend or a family member or a therapist, you want to get those things out. Um, and if you can't speak to anyone, writing things down. I've done that a lot, where you just mm -hmm. write yourself a note, get it out, crumble it up, throw it out, and you move on. And going through, you know, actually putting a pen to paper and saying, you know, I'm feeling this way, getting it out feels so good. Because then it just becomes something on a piece of paper and you say, that's not my reality. And you chuck it and you can move on and you can heal. You mentioned, um, you mentioned that uh, even if it's not a crisis. So do you see people texting in that are, are not in crisis? They're kind of getting it catching it early? Yeah. So we have all different situations. So it could be something as simple as, you know, I'm having a hard time in school You know, I'm not seeing any friends. There's a lot of schoolwork. And, you know, I'll ask, are you having thoughts of suicide with all these pressures? And they'll say, no, I just, you know, kind of just need someone to talk to. That's a little, a lot. The majority of people just need someone to speak with because they don't feel like overwhelming their friends. They don't feel like overwhelming their families because there is a boundary in those relationships, you know, your friends and your family are not your therapist, but they are there for you. So you have to figure out how much you can share with them and how much you can tell them because, you know, they are a specific relationship and you don't want to, you know, they're not going to be able to give you the same advice that a real professional could give you. So it's important to kind of figure out where the line goes and where it's time to reach out to someone who is a trained professional rather than a friend or a family member. Right. Yeah, and it's, <clears throat> some, yeah, sometimes people don't want to tell their friends. They don't want their friends to know um, or their family. I know I've heard quite a few people say, because I don't want them to worry about me. Mm -hmm. Like they have enough stress in their life and I don't want to add to that. Um, and I don't want to be, you know, cause any more problems or stress. And, and, and maybe, you know, they have tried telling their friends or their family and it just, they didn't get a good response, yeah. you know, and maybe it was just like, wow, definitely not going to talk to them about it. 
Uh, one question I like to ask sometimes is what would you, what advice would you give a friend in your situation? Because then a lot right. of people say, well, I would be so warm to my friend. I would help them, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I say, okay, so think of maybe your friend feels the same way. If they're mm -hmm. very hesitant to open up to someone, I try to give them the confidence that they need to go and share it with someone else and to share it with someone close to them in their life that may be able to be that person for them that, you know, when they can't reach out to a crisis line, they can reach out to someone in their everyday life and they have that person. So kind of asking, I think that's a really great question to ask people. I even ask, ask myself because sometimes, you know, we're always way harder on ourselves than we are on anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I like to say, you know, I tell myself, would you say that about your friend, what you're saying about yourself? Would you say that about your friend? No, you wouldn't. So mm -hmm. don't say that. You know, we tend to be so much more critical and so much harder on ourselves and I remind myself, I would never say that about anyone I care about. I should, you know, treat myself like I would treat a friend. That's a, something I remind myself every day. Treat myself as if I were my friend. Because we do tend to neglect that and to not think we're, you know, worthy enough of treating ourselves as we treat the ones we love. Right. So it's, it's a common thing that we see a lot. For, I can relate to that myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's so much easier to be uh, kind to someone else than it is to be myself, to, to be kind to myself and to show myself um, self-compassion. Yeah. Um, because we do tend to be harder on ourselves and um, it can be, <clears throat> sometimes we can be our, in our, get in our own way. We can be our own worst enemy. Um, yeah. and, and with and struggling with mental health, you know, we don't always have control over those emotions, you know, because people, there's a myth out there about depression or anxiety, schizophrenia. It's like, you know, well, just stop thinking that, you know, and then you'll feel better. Or if you just like, you know, explain to me a little bit more how um, it's, it's not a choice. So, you know, a lot of people come in and say, I hate that I'm, I hate that I'm feeling this way. And I hate that this is the situation I'm in. And, you know, we remind people, it is not your fault that you're in this situation. There are other external factors that contribute to it. And a lot of what, like you said, the myth about depression and stuff, a lot of people are like, well, just stop being sad. It is not even remotely that simple. There are thoughts that are in our heads that we can't control sometimes and we can't get them to be quiet. As much as we would love for them mm -hmm. to stop ruling our day, they rule our day. So that's why it's important to, you know, when we work with people, find out what's going to help them get through or, you know, live with what's happening and what's going on in their head. We have to help them, give them that support to figure out what help them help themselves. So, so it, and it, it's, it's great that, you know, you are educating them at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. And the more and more we can educate people, they can then educate people. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I learned that my brain disease was not my fault, mm -hmm. I didn't do, I, I'm not like, um, you know, a, a weak person because, you know, I have bipolar two disorder and I'm not, you know, I remember before I was diagnosed, I was just called, oh, she's just overly emotional. You know, that's just, that's just Amy. She's just overly emotional. She has this. And it's just kind of like, once I was diagnosed, I felt a little bit better knowing that, okay, so there's nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And I, I can learn how to manage. I like what you said, live with, live mm -hmm. and work through these hard times and validating, you know, with, with texters, with callers, with other people in our life that, you know, we, it's not our fault that we are feeling these now it's an opportunity for us to decide what we're going to do mm -hmm. that's where our power comes from like that's where yeah. like okay so so this is how i'm feeling i know it's not my fault but so now what am i going to do with this mm -hmm. and being in that tough situation tech you know texting reaching out talking to you through text and then they get to decide okay where do i want to go from here mm -hmm. And do you ever have people follow up and, and text again and say, I have, I've talked to someone before and I, I wanted, it worked for me? Have you? Um, I don't 
I think um, there's definitely people who have texted in before. Um, they don't really mention it usually, but you can definitely tell if someone like has reached out before. Yeah. And how can you tell? Um, I think they just kind of, you know, will say, I've been told to try this before and that's not working. Yeah. And, you know, people have told me so many times to do this and that's not enough. So we take it a step further and say, okay, if that's not enough, what can we do to make it, what can we do to make it enough? Yeah. And, 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 and being careful not to go because we can fix this. Exactly. You know, and, and I can't promise anything. You can't. And I often, when I'm training people in suicide prevention and how to have these conversations, you know, you can't fix that. You don't have the power. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that you can do is, is to create that space and to guide them through. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's such a valuable resource and it's such a valuable thing you are doing for people. I mean, it's, it's really incredible that you, you spend so much of your time. Um, and, and it's not, and I'm glad to hear that you've learned how to cope with that. Um, you've learned about your own mental health. Sounds like you've been growing through this experience. hundred yeah, percent. Definitely. And I've learned also, you know, I'm a very anxious person. So when I first started, I felt very prepared, but I was also terrified. Like someone's life is in my hands right now. Like, uh, am I going to mess up? Am I going to say the wrong thing? But now I've really gained so much confidence to know that, you know, there's never any perfect answer, but you really can make such a difference just by listening to people and moving away from giving people advice or telling people what to do, but by hearing them out and saying, you know, you mentioned you like this. It sounds like you're, you know, really loving person. The world needs more people like you. And just kind of, they just need to hear those things. And they're sincere. When I make those comments, I don't just, you know, they're not randomized. They're very sincere comments based on what, you know, someone reaches out and tells me. I say, you know, I give them what they are not hearing in their life. Mm. Yeah. And I know you've probably had some pretty um, intense conversations. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, that have, that you probably would say would, was life-changing. Mm -hmm. um, what was your toughest conversation? If you can think of the toughest, are you, can you tell us? Can you give us a little detail? I can definitely give a little detail. The toughest one was with um, someone who was underage and they were dealing with abuse at home. And we, you know, I was working with them to try to get them to report it. And they were going back and forth for so long. You know, I don't want to get my family in trouble. And, you know, I, you understand that these, it's, it's a child who is in stuck between a rock and a hard place because mm -hmm. they're dealing with abuse at home, but they also don't want to, you know, get their family in trouble. So those are really, really tough when they're young kids. You know, I have had recently a really positive experience with a young person texting in that started the conversation saying, you know, I am ready to take my own life. And at the end of the conversation, they said to me, because of this, because you listen to me, I am not taking my life. And, you know, one thing I said of them was I was really proud of them for opening up so much because it's hard to, and I acknowledge it's hard to open up to a stranger via text. That's not easy. And they said, just hearing you say, I'm proud of you changed my entire mood. Like my entire night was changed by hearing I'm proud of you. And it's like, you know, one thing I've learned is kindness and empathy are free. It doesn't cost anything to really just be an ear. To someone to listen to someone to hear someone out and validate them that's free yeah and it's you know it's priceless really how did it make you feel when you heard that when i heard that i have never in my life um cried tears of joy and i i cried because i was so happy 
that just by, you know, I worked with someone and they really help themselves at the end of the day. But the fact that I could be a little guiding figure into someone, you know, making a realization on their own was unreal. It was so priceless. And I just really felt like, you know, I was so glad that I made sure to do my shift that night and that I signed on at the right time and that maybe had this person not speak to me, maybe there would be a different situation. But, you know, it really made me feel like I'm so grateful. I went on for my shift. I, you know, saw I was on at that time. Just so happened to be you. You just happened to be there. Um, they just so happened to text at that time. I mean, it's, it is divine how yeah. um, these things come about and the people that come into our lives and we're able to, you know, and, and it's like, if I had canceled my training that day, or, you know, if, if that student hadn't um, been at school that day, they just so happened to be at school that day when I presented yep. and I told them that, you know, that they matter and that they're not alone. Yeah. And that, you know, there's, there are people who care about them mm -hmm. and the, and the ones that, that come up afterwards that say, you know, you really made a difference. I really like what you're teaching and it makes, it makes a huge difference. Um, and that it actually motivates me even more, especially in the times that I'm so tired. Like have you ever been on, on work and you're just, just exhausted? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's hard, but then you think of those moments and it drives you and it becomes like this burst of energy. Like I did this, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to power through because I know that I've made such an impact before. I'm going to keep that up until I'm done. And then you can be tired later, but it can be like such a little, like a, a, a jump start when you think mm -hmm. about specific, you know, good conversations you've had. I use that as, you know, motivation mm -hmm. um, when I'm having a hard time. Have you ever been able to identify with any of the situations and 100%. been like, yeah, what was it like? It just kind of put me at ease to know I'm not alone. We're in a pandemic. I'm, you know, a young person living at home with my family. That's hard when you're supposed to be out on your own, living in your own place, you know. And there are so many other young people that are really struggling. And I always think I'm alone and I'm the only one struggling. And that, you know, everyone else is fine. That's not the reality. There are a lot of young people right now who are going through such a hard time. You know, the uh, job market is horrible. Mm -hmm. We are stuck inside. It's starting to get colder out. The days are getting shorter. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on. So I just remind myself, you know, when I see someone text in with, you know, kind of the same sentiment, I'm like, oh, this makes me feel good. It really makes me feel good because it reminds, and I can tell them, you know, so many other people are going through the same thing. Do not think that you are alone. Know that so many others are struggling and that it should give you kind of like a, a sigh of relief. I am not alone. And so do you, do you learn, like, is there a rule you can't give any personal information? You wouldn't, yeah. You can't give any personal information. You're not like, oh yeah, girl, me too. I'm just, no. I'm like doing that. <laughs> I wish. You gotta uh, be like, hey, actually, you want to be friends? You're really yeah, cool. Like, you want to call me later? <laughs> so would you recommend people to do this? To volunteer? 100%. Um, anyone over 18 can volunteer. Training was two weeks and it is so straightforward. They give you all of the tools to succeed. So anyone who's looking to connect with others during this isolating time and make a difference, I 100% recommend it. It has been so, so great. Do they have to have any experience? No. You don't have to have any experience, and you just do a little background check. You have two people write a reference for you. It can be anyone. Like, I had my friend write a reference for me and my mom. Mm -hmm. Like, it can literally, it doesn't have to be professional. It can be people right. who know you. Um, and then I heard back in a few days and next thing I knew I was signed up for training. It was much shorter than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to have to wait like a month. Um, but especially young people who are struggling right now, um, you know, finding a job, et cetera. I think it's a great, a great thing to do. So what are your shifts? Like how long are your shifts and how often do you volunteer? And do you get a chance to, to so, make a schedule? 
you do a commitment of 200 hours and um, uh, you do like four hours a week, pretty much. So you can do two shifts, two hours. So I like to do nighttime shifts just because that's when things are kind of, it's pretty active. Um, so I, you pick whatever times you want and whatever days you want. And I, you can make it like each week if you wanted to, if you had, you know, work was going to keep you late on Wednesday. So you could switch your shift to Thursday evening. Like you have that ability to be really flexible. And um, if you have anything personal going on, you have the opportunity to take off some shifts. Like you can really, they help you make it work perfectly. Like there's no excuses for you to say I'm too busy because they really, you can fit this into your schedule. Four hours a week, two, two hours, two days a week. Everyone can fit that in their schedule. And so it sounds like they're pretty supportive. It sounds like they are, um, they support your mental health. So supportive. You have a coach you're assigned to throughout um, training and they reach out to you to make sure you're doing okay. And if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to them. They're supervisors on the shift. And if I ever say, you know, I'm not sure how to answer this question, they'll help me. And oh, that's great. The start of the shift, they reach out and say, thank you so much for being here. We're here for you. Let us know if you need anything. And that feels so, so great that you're being so supported during this. Yeah, it's, um, cause it's equally important for, for all of us to, um, to be there for each other, especially in these stressful times and not knowing, you know, cause you never know what they're going to text, which exactly. is probably kind of like, eh. yeah, yeah, it um, is. You send out a text and then, um, you just kind of waiting. What are they going to say? It must yeah. kind of be those moments, huh? Uh-huh. And sometimes like you're waiting and you think, oh, they're not responding, but they're sending like a huge paragraph. And so you're like, oh, okay, this is a lot. Let me buckle up. Okay. They wrote a book. They wrote a book. Exactly. And then Forget sometimes him. it could be one sentence, but it yeah. can be like a really tough one sentence. It could be like, you know, I'm feeling the absolute worst I've ever felt. I have no desire to live. Or it can be, you know, two huge paragraphs of this happened at school, this, 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 like it's so different. You never, you don't really know what you're going into when you sign on. So there can be that underlying anxiety, but with the preparation and the support you have, there is no reason to, to, to worry. Right. Right. So um, how can they access crisis text line again? Like the, so, their, they have a website and the text number itself. So tell us. Yeah, about so the website. Can, uh, search up Crisis Text Line. The website will pop up and it has all the information on how to volunteer or if you need their services, how to text in and reach out. Okay. And then um, do they have any specific pandemic information on there about mental health or resources? Um, yeah, there are definitely um, resources that um, we're given a whole list of different referrals and resources, so different websites that apply. So if someone's reaching out talking about, um, you know, abuse, we have resources that I can give them. And I always ask before, I don't just share a resource. I say, would you be interested if I share? If someone's feeling anxious, I can give them um, a referral to um, some audio grounding exercises. Um, there's so many different amazing resources that we're able to share with texters. Um, so for the pandemic, there is a whole section on pandemic resources that we're able to share. Excellent. Well, that's, again, thank you for the work that you're doing and it's volunteer. So you're, you're not getting paid. It's not a job, but it is, it's a yeah. job, but it's, you know, and it's again, giving, giving of your time, giving of yourself and making a difference in people's lives. And you'll never meet them. Yeah. Most likely you'll never meet these people, but yet yeah, you left, um, you made an impact on them. You left, uh, you know, them with a feeling that they weren't alone. And I think that's the key message right now. Yeah. is connecting and connection during such an isolating, polarizing time. It's just being able to, even though we're not speaking on the phone, even just by text, reading that you're talking to a real life person. A lot of people are like, are you a robot? How do I know that you're real? I'm like, no, I promise you I'm real. Like I'm, I'm sitting doing this. I'm eating ice cream. Like I'm, I'm doing normal things. Like I'm very much real, not a robot. Yeah. Um, and just providing people that personal connection is so important. Right. 
I love that. Um, and I appreciate you so much, just all the help that you've given Dancing with Ed, volunteering your time, um, all of the, the social media stuff that you do for us and the newsletter and um, and just the, um, the emotional mental support that you have often given me when I have had my bad days. You're just a very encouraging person and I really, really appreciate your time and, and thank you for sharing your, your experiences with us and your knowledge and your heart. Um, and, and yeah, so just continue to do the amazing things that you do. I've, I have no doubt that you'll do that. And um, thank you again for your time.